Well, hello, hello again, friends. We are so excited to be here. We know it's been a long time. This is Between the Shadows. We are your hosts. This is Kristen. This is Kara. Y'all, thank you so much for coming back and joining us. We know how long it's been, y'all. <laughs> yeah. It has been since Halloween of 2022, y'all. Ooh, and we're, <laughs> we're almost the same Patty's <laughs> Day, 2023. <laughs> but y'all, this is Between the Shadows, and we are so happy to be back. And we just want to say we took a nice little sabbatical, gave some family some love, and yeah. did some things. And y'all, it is good to be back. We are excited to be back. Yes. And the last saga we talked about was the dream curse, and y'all, that one just just took a little bit of a toll on us. So, yeah. So a little break time is good, but we are, again, we are excited to be back, and we are excited to be moving on in the story. And um, before we get started, um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Patrick McRae for guest spotting on our show on Halloween. We appreciate you so much. Definitely. I loved what you had to say, and I cannot wait to have you back. Yes. I cannot wait. Cannot wait to have you back, Patrick. Yes, yes. And um, thank you to Jewel, of course, Jewel from Resident of Collinwood on YouTube mm-hmm. for having us back on. We are going to be joining him again very soon to be talking about the 1795 story arc. Yeah. So we're pretty excited about that, too. Love it. So, friends, I just want to get back into this because it's been a while and I'm ready to talk some Dark Shadows. Let's go. So the last place we left off, of course, we wrapped up the Dream Curse in its entirety. Um, Barnabas died and came back and Adam died and came back and they're both alive and well and Barnabas pretty much told Cassandra to go to hell. Here I am. Your curse didn't work, and <laughs> I'm not afraid of the morning no more. <laughs> so that's where we are. That's that's where we are in the story. So all right, jump back into it. We're going to be talking about. Well, I say the death of Cassandra Collins, but we know how Angelique is. For those of us who have seen this past <laughs> past this saga, we know what happens here. Uh-huh. Um, so. So I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. So Carolyn, now that Adam is alive and well. Carolyn has hidden Adam in the west wing of Collinwood. And she figures that is the one place nobody will even think to look for him. That nobody will even think to look for him at Collinwood anyway, but definitely not the west wing. And and Carolyn is very grateful to Adam because Adam saved her life on Widow's Hill and went over himself. So she she feels sort of indebted to Adam at this point. So the west wing is deserted and locked up and she figures that's the best place so really only carolyn and the professor professor stokes are the only ones who knows that he is there and will be there and cassandra is in the drawing room stewing about why her curse didn't work (laughs) (laughs) and it's it's great it's it's so for me it's so great to see angelique so agitated (laughs) right (laughs) because of all the the destruction and the damage and the and the crap she has caused it's just (laughs) uh it, it gives me a little satisfaction to see her see her so irked (laughs) <laughs> I feel that, like that's kind of often, though. Like, nothing yeah. ever goes the way she plans. I, it Somebody always throws a wrench in it. It doesn't. You know, and she has to work around it, you it, know? Exactly. If we think back to 1795, all that plotting and planning to make Barnabas hers, and she didn't expect to put a curse on Barnabas and make him a vampire, and that didn't go down the way she thought it would. Right. The second Barnabas got up out of his coffin, he choked her out, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I guess I have to agree with you, you know? It, nothing goes the way Angelique thinks it will. Yeah. And, I mean, but, but there, is a, there is a touch of satisfaction in that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so David, David walks in. She walks, walks in on her stewing because he wants her to help him with the tape recorder. Remember, Julia gave David the tape recorder because she was trying to get rid of him. Right. And, but she, she's not interested. She shoes him out, and she's busy. And she is determined to figure out why this curse didn't work, why it didn't happen. Right. So David gets Carolyn to help him instead of Cassandra. And as soon as Carolyn has left the room, David hears the message on the tape recorder that was actually meant for Julia. Uh-huh. You know, the... Julia. Yes. <laughs> when you hear this. <laughs> when you do the experiment again. <laughs> Addison Powell, I know, I, I, th- I think he's dead now, but oh my gosh, I, I don't care. I don't care what people say about Addison Powell. I thought he was excellent as Dr. Lang. Yeah. I, I just don't even care. Yeah. That is my opinion. I am sticking to it. Haters going to hate. So. <laughs> <laughs> so about this time that he's hearing the message on the tape recorder, Maggie is on the phone to Collinwood to let them know what Willie told her about Barnabas that night. Like, Willie, after, before, you know, because Julia was like, I'm going to take you to Wincliffe, you're going to be my housekeeper, I'm going to give you a job, um, because Dar- Barnabas had died, you know. So Willie is in town, you know, tying up loose ends, getting his, his, getting his affairs in order, and goes to see Maggie. Like, he cannot let Maggie go, yeah. but, but tells Maggie that Barnabas is dead. So, so Maggie is phoning Collinwood now. 
and she wants to make sure that they that they all know that Barnabas has died. And everybody's like, what? Barnabas is dead? What? Mm -hmm. Except for Nicholas, because he just assumes that Cassandra's curse worked, you know, and he's looking pretty pleased about it. (laughs) And even even he denies knowing what and who Cassandra really is when Vicky brings it up. Because Vicky is like, holy crap, Barnabas is dead. And, you know, she she confronts Nicholas and he's like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know. And she demands to know what his interest in the family is, but Nicholas assures her that it is just because Cassandra, his sister, has married into it. So Cassandra comes into the room and tells them all that Barnabas is in fact alive and well and that she has seen him. Didn't tell them the nature of which she saw him, but he's he's fine. He's alive. Mm. <laughs> that I had mean, to be hard words to choke out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's fine. Sorry, but... <laughs> <laughs> After hearing that news, Nicholas pulls Cassandra into the drawing room and she immediately begins to tell him that she doesn't know what went wrong. Uh, He's quick to tell her that she simply failed and he, and he would like to know why. I, you know, Nicholas's handling of Cassandra is just, it's so funny. Like, Nicholas basically it. stole the show from Angelique when uh-huh. he came on. He stole it from her. You and know, I think over all this time, I think that's why she was so stressed out with her spells and yeah. her curses. Yeah. Because she knew Nicholas, Nicholas was right on her that. butt mm. if she'd screwed anything up i agree i mean I have, I have a feeling nicholas had a large part to do with that and i don't i don't know this because they don't say this but i kind of wonder if that's what nicholas had intended just just to show that he's better than her i don't know yeah <laughs> like i'm in charge here and you know I, I don't know because he he's always doing this to her like like even at the end of this you know He's like, well, go and ask Barnabas for forgiveness. And if he forgives you, then you'll be all right. He knows good and well that he's not going to forgive her, but he wants to just send her on a wild goose chase just because it's fun for him. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> and she begs him, like, for a chance to figure out what went wrong. Mm-hmm. Like, give me a chance to figure it out. Yeah, and like, I'll fix it. <laughs> yeah. And he accuses her of having emotion and loving Barnabas. Mm-hmm. Like, he thinks that's what her weakness is. Yeah. Like, and that's why... Like, her power is weakened because yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Or in the end, if it's like Barnabas she's trying to curse, in the end she just can't completely fully commit. Because her heart's not in it. Because like Nicholas she said, him. because she loves him. <laughs> and we, we've had many, many conversations about this. I mean, it's my opinion yeah. that if Cassandra slash Angelique didn't feel about Barnabas the way she did, I feel like she could have been a very powerful, very successful witch. Absolutely. I mean, I think she could have brought down so much hell on so many people if she had just, if she could just simply free herself from her human emotions, not just for Barnabas, just in general. In general, yeah. Like, like Angelique is a, is a powerful witch, but she's also a very, she's a, she's a woman. She She's a woman yeah. with emotions like we all have. Yeah. And I think if Angelique could have freed herself from those emotions, from Barnabas, from feeling the, the way she felt about Barnabas, my gosh, the hell she could have brought on, on folks, the Collinses and everyone she came into contact with. Absolutely. But because she loved Barnabas and, and loved him so fiercely, her powers and her intentions seem to just take a backseat to all of that. Yeah. Well, and at that point, Nicholas is like, you know what? He's like, by... Pu- he punishes her basically yeah. by giving her like only till midnight to figure out why her curse didn't work. Yeah, yeah. And he informs her that if she doesn't figure it out by midnight, then they're gonna bar- then their bargain would be off. Now we've talked about this bargain, and we don't ent- entirely know what it is, right? But I think, and and it's again just my opinion. You know, this we love to speculate on this show, and my speculation is, I think that Nicholas had some sort of involvement with allowing Angelique to piggyback on Vicky when she came back. And for her to exist at Collinwood in the way she is as Cassandra, I think that was Nicholas's bargain. Okay, but you got to make this curse, you know, fulfilled again. That's believable. I, I, I th- that's what I think. I think, that's, I think that may be part of what the bargain is. Yeah, but he gives her a little taste of... <laughs> he gives her a little taste of what's going to happen <laughs> at midnight if she has no answers. Yeah. And she looks down at her hand, and it's just turning pretty much into bones. Yeah, it's all haggard like just looking. shriveling up. <laughs> and she's like, that this one skeleton hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the wedding ring on it, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, like we are now, Nicholas just stands there and laughs. Yeah, just... <laughs> as her hand is turning into a skeleton. See, and he... I-, I think he got great joy out of... Yeah. Out of making her miserable. Like torturing her. <laughs> I mean, but... Can you blame him? She's yeah, so she's true. such an easy target. Yeah, exactly. She is him. an easy target. For, 
it, it's like they they literally act like they're they're posing as brother and sister, but they kind of seem that way. Yeah, yeah you know, like, definitely. Like Nicholas is the is the powerful older brother, and yeah. you know, picking on his younger sister. Absolutely. And I mean, this is way on another scale, of course, but. <laughs> 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 Nicholas Blair, I, I, I just, I really feel like he just really stole the show as a dark entity, as, as a supernatural character. Mm-hmm. Like, he's more powerful than Angelique, and clearly there's a pecking order going on here. I mean, clearly, like, the older brother, you know, I, I know they're not really, you know, they're just posing that way, but it really yeah. feels that way. Yeah, it's and, like they've known each other for ages, like, right. yeah, I, I agree, they act like they're siblings. Yeah, and I mean, as horrible as Angelique has been up to this point, it was kind of nice to see someone who was more powerful than she was, and to get to her and to get to see her get at least some of her just desserts, you know. Right. Cassandra starts with Willie, like she's on a quest now. She's only got a few hours, you know. Right. Because he was the one that told Maggie that Barnabas was dead, so mm-hmm. he's like, okay, this this boy's got to have some info here. <laughs> yeah. She was able to summon him, and he tells her everything that happened when Barnabas had the dream curse, mm-hmm. and everything that happened once he went outside and found the bat and got bitten and how he and Julia buried him. Like, he told her everything. Yeah. And basically, Cassandra didn't find out what went wrong, only that it did. And Nicholas tells her that much, you know? Yeah. It's like, okay, well, we already know what happened. You didn't find out why, though. That was your assignment. And (laughs) Nicholas continues just to taunt her and tell her what a failure she is, and she continues to beg him for more time. Yeah. Beg him. But instead of... (laughs) He was like, okay... I'm not going to kill you at midnight. I'm not going to I'm not going to punish you at midnight. Instead, I'm going to punish you at nine (laughs) o'clock. And he know he knows he knows. Like, give me a break. (laughs) Like, instead of giving her more time, he gives her less time to figure it out. In fact, he only gives her an hour. Yeah. Like, no. Instead of four hours, I'm giving you one. You got one hour to figure it out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And he knows it's impossible for her to find out what she needs to know. So he tells her just to prepare for the moment of her destruction. It gives You have an hour to prepare for your destruction. Oh, my goodness. It's so cruel, but at the same time, it's so entertaining to watch. It really is. Again, like, <laughs> just watching him be Nicholas. Yes. It is, again, it's so entertaining. Like, he is, he's very good at the character they yes, gave him. Like, he's Alan very Ostrino good at it. Like, like, this role was made for Humbert Allen Ostrater. Oh it just God. was. I mean, he... <laughs> <laughs> Barry calls him Cat Scratch Fever. <laughs> he <laughs> kind of is like Cat, cat, cat Scratch Fever. I can't even say it. Cat Scratch Fever. <laughs> but, I mean, he's just got that sinister smile yes. and that laugh. And just, like, his mannerisms, just, he's so good at it. <laughs> it's true. He really is. But, and it, it takes a special kind of person, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, you know, the same questions that Laura Parker gets... You know, for playing Angelique, are you really a witch? Do you really do this? You know, I could ask the same questions of Humbert Allen Australia. Oh, yeah. So it gets to be just about 9 o'clock, the moment of Angelique's destruction. (laughs) And David comes calling on Cassandra again about the tape recorder. But this time, he wants her to hear the message that he heard. And she's uninterested in it until David says the magic word, Barnabas's affliction. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. And her ears perk up so fast, like a little kitty cat... And she hears the message in its entirety and realizes why her dream curse failed. And she sends David up to his room and shouts to the top of her lungs for Nicholas. Nicholas! Nicholas! Like shouting up the stairs and she turns around there he is in the drawing room. Yes? You (laughs) rang? You bellowed? (laughs) Right. Like, like she's literally shouting up the stairs for him, and he just, he, she turns around, and there he is. <laughs> oh, I love it. Just it's so sinister-like, like we were just saying, because, you know, he was upstairs, and then he was in the drawing room. Yeah. Just like that. He could just, like, appear. Yeah. I love it. Crazy like that. And we were, we were literally this close, like, so close to Angelique's destruction, and she found out purely by accident. And this makes Nicholas spare her. <sighs> because he's more intrigued really yes yes exactly yeah so once he hears this message he's way more interested in the fact that lang created a human being than cassandra's curse at all he agrees to let her live as long as she stays useful and doesn't make any more mistakes yeah (laughs) so do what i tell you or you're out yeah basically like the way he's like yeah you can stick around as long as you're useful you know and i'm like well the second you step in my way you're out like we have that fear you know in the human world, you know, like as a job or, you know, if we're in a friendship where the person's only interested in what you can do for him, it's like, mm-hmm. okay, well, how long until I'm not useful anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think I think Angelique was maybe feeling some of that, too. And, like, as he's listening to it, 
is that you can just see the wheels start to turn in his head. Yes. When he learns that Dr. Lang had created a human being. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. It's impossible. Like, how the hell would anybody do this? Right, right. Not even he could fathom it. And he even says that this would open up a world of possibilities. Yeah. And at this point in the show, we don't know what that means yet. Yeah. But we know that Nicholas wants to make a race of human beings that would serve the devil, his boss. His boss, yep. And yeah. knowing knowing that Joe Haskell was the last person to even see Adam before he was attacked, yeah, yeah. or before Adam attacked him, rather, Nicholas decides to pay a visit to Maggie Evans. Mm-hmm. And Cassandra is curious to know why he wants to see her, but he isn't opening up about his potential plans for her yet. Like, no, he's I, like, I, I don't have to share a thing with you. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> it's like you've already messed up. You're lucky. You're lucky. You're even in. You're this lucky. Place. You're still here. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you're lucky to even be on this trip. <laughs> <laughs> for real. You have no lines in this play. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget your wieners. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but he shows up at Maggie's house and. Just as an excuse, really, I guess. He offers her to be there. He offers her, like, two grand for one of her dad's paintings. Yep, yep. And just small chit-chats with her about Adam and Joe. But I kind of think he shows up purely just to see Maggie. Yeah, just to see her. I mean, he's seen her once before, right? Yeah, he has. And, like, the second he laid eyes on her, he was just, like, immersed. Yeah, it was like a love at first sight yeah. thing. Goes back to the demons having feelings, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then back at Collinwood, David... Um, goes up to retrieve the tape recorder, um, but of course Cassandra won't give it to him now. Yep. Now that she knows what, what she's heard, what she's heard. Right. And she, she um, hasn't stopped listening to this tape recorder. Yeah, ever she since has played she it over and over and over again. Right. After she won't give it up back to David, um, yep. he goes down to the old house to get Julia to ask her about the message. Yep. And even Julia hasn't heard this yet, obviously. Right, right. I don't think they ever actually hear the I message. I don't think they, they never actually hear it. The only reason, like this scene right here, I was like, yes, she's finally going to hear it. Yeah. Yes, finally. Yeah. But David couldn't remember. Of couldn't course. remember of for course. the life of him what was on the message. Can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was ugh, it was so frustrating. He can't remember for the life of him what was actually said. So he, he brought Julia back. He was like, just come and listen to the message, you know. To hear the message, but of course, Cassandra swapped out the tapes. Yeah, she had just enough time to... Yeah. And this was, once again, it was so frustrating to watch because they needed so badly to hear what was on this message, you know? So the race is on to find Adam, both for Nicholas and for Julia and Barnabas. Like, the the race is on to find Adam. Everybody's looking for him. And nobody but Carolyn and the professor knows where he is. Yeah. So this brings us back to Sarah and Harry Johnson. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sarah, Mrs. Johnson, notices that food's gone missing from the kitchen. And, you know, Mrs. Johnson, she runs an excellent tight ship, and she notices when there's food missing. (laughs) And she, of course, blames Harry because she's had trouble with Harry in the past. Harry's been to jail, you know. And she blames Harry for stealing stealing food for his miscreant friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, we realize very quickly that it's actually Carolyn who's trying to feed Adam. Right. And... He's lonely and understandably, and he loves when Carolyn comes up to see him because Mm -hmm. he's so lonely, you know, Mm -hmm. and Carolyn is literally the first person besides the professor, besides Sam Evans, that has been kind to Adam. Yeah. And through and through. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even Willie wasn't kind to him. We've already established that. Oh my God, Willie was so mean. (laughs) He was so mean to him. Oh my God, it was horrible. That most famous chicken leg scene, man. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) That shit was funny. It was. I'm sorry. (laughs) Poor Adam just trying to eat the dang chicken. He's so hungry because that's the one thing you know. It's food. I need food. Yeah. And Willie's just dangling it and eating it in front of him. Oh my God. He's like a baby. I know. It's horrible. Sorry you're laughing. It was kind of funny, though. It was entertaining. It was funny how Adam almost beat the shit out of him. (laughs) Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I agree. So, so Carolyn comes to see him and he tries to quote a poem from a book, and he seems to be very attracted to Carolyn. Mm -hmm. And not just because Carolyn's being nice to him, Adam is kind of experiencing love for the first time. Yeah. And I think it's it's interesting to me. It's interesting to me that Adam, who was just learning to speak and express himself and who is purely man made, has urges of a romantic type. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. because Carolyn has been kind to him and that's why he gravitates to her. I mean, again, it's like a baby. It's like a child. Right. Like, 
if they can smell it on you, they won't want to come near you. Exactly, exactly. You know? But and but I just I think it's so interesting that you know even as a man made man. You know, and, and the things that Professor t- told him and taught him, because Professor did excellent work with Adam. Yeah. Like, turned him into a regular human being who could s- speak for the most part. and Like, you Barnabas know. was shocked. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because Barnabas hasn't seen him since he ran off from Willie with the chicken leg, I think, you know? But, yeah, yeah. But, so, he, like, Barnabas has no idea how much Adam has progressed at this point. Yeah. And I, I just... It's, it's just incredible that one of the very first urges that he has of his own volition is love. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like that primal instinct, you know, even though he's a man-made man. It's just, yeah. it's incredible to me. And I mean, Carolyn seems to have some attraction to Adam as well, but I think at this point, it just seems to be more pity than anything. And it's, it's, it's really difficult at this point in the show to tell, Yeah, you know, I mean, like I said, Carolyn feels indebted to him. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, maybe it's like a Florence Nightingale effect, you know, he saved my life. So I'm in love with him, you know, Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't know, but Barnabas comes calling and asks Carolyn where Adam is, and she refuses to know any information, and, and she claims to have no idea where he is. Uh-huh. And she even tells Mrs. Johnson that if Barnabas comes calling for her again to tell him that she is out and she doesn't want to see him at all. Yeah. Nosy ass Harry. <laughs> no, I'm just yeah. kidding. No, I'm well, kidding. you're not wrong. That's a thing. But he always seems to be lurking around corners and stuff, mm-hmm. looking for trouble. <laughs> no. Yep. But anyways, he overhears and picks the lock to the West Wing to investigate. Yep. He finds Adam and attempts to turn Adam into the, into the but, police. Like turns him in, yeah. Wants turn, to turn turns, him in. Turn him into the police because there um, is a prize on Adam's head. Yeah. Um, but Adam ends up overpowering him and almost kills him actually with his own knife. Yeah. But Carolyn luckily comes in r- right at that moment and stops him. You know, I was gonna say at this point, why is there a price on Adam's head? Because really, he hasn't done anything illegal. However, <laughs> Sam Evans is dead now because of him. So I guess technically that could be. Yes, unfortunately. Yeah, so, I mean... He killed, like, his only friend. One of his only friends. Like, like He didn't mean to. Didn't mean to. It was a total... You know, Adam... Just doesn't know his own strength. Exactly, yeah. Mm. So... That was really sad. I agree. It was. That was one of those situations, you know, where I was, like... You know, Maggie lost her dad, and it was so friggin' sad. Oh, horrible. And I was sad to see David Ford leave the show because I loved him oh, up to this point. Me you know? too. And they never really brought him back. Uh, they didn't bring him back. No, did he, they? he completely left. And yeah. I don't. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know if one of if one of you listeners out there, if you do know, let, please let us know. I, I don't know if this was because he just wanted to leave the show. I don't know if this is because he and Nancy Barrett got divorced. I don't know. Yeah. I honest to God don't know. So if somebody out there knows, I'd love to know too. So <laughs> <laughs> so Carolyn stops Adam stops Adam from killing Harry and basically she and Harry get into this stalemate because Carolyn wants Harry to keep the secret and she gives him a salary to help take care of Adam and stages it as hiring him as a chauffeur just to please his mother. Yeah. Because she does, definitely didn't want busybody yeah. Miss Johnson knowing what's going on. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, I bet that's where Harry gets it because, you know, Mrs. Johnson's a little busybody too. <laughs> Lurking yeah. at Well, table. I mean, you remember the very beginning, she was a spy for, for Bert Devlin. That's true. That's true. Miss Busybody herself. <laughs> I don't. Th- I, I think some of that never died. I, th- I think she's still kind of lurking at keyholes, but this time she's just keeping her mouth shut. You know, yeah. she won't talk to anybody about the Collins. It's because she became very loyal to the Collins family. Yes. You know. Yes. I mean, even into the end, like at the tail when they're in 1995, and yes. she's still alive, and all the Collinses are dead. Yes. You know, she was like, "I don't want. I'm not saying a word about the Collinses. I'm not saying a word." You know. Yep. And so I think. She is a busybody. She knows all of the Collins' business, but she won't tell us all. Yeah. I just don't think that... I don't think she would. Yeah. Carolyn goes back to talk to talk Adam down out of his out of this rage and let him know what's going on. Harry's going to help, you know, and this is where Adam tries to kiss Carolyn because he saw it in a book. Yeah. He saw it in a book because that's all he has time to do is read, and it makes her really uncomfortable. And Like, he notices her jolt back. Like, yeah. He's like... And, and, and his first taste of rejection towards someone he really like loves like yeah. not not loves like like a platonic love like loves like in love in like, love yeah. yeah and she tells the professor about it when he comes over to bring Adam some more books and he explains that the most important thing for him to do right now is study and learn so he can be more independent and yes. be more you know successful in life and you know when it comes time for him to live on his own you know yeah 
And Pro- Professor tries to get answers from Julia about the dream curse. Still trying. He's still trying, y'all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and why it didn't work. And sh- and wants to know why she knows about the connection or what she knows about the connection between Barnabas and Adam. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Julia is still very tight-lipped. Doesn't want to give any details. But um, Professor tells her that he thinks the contention between Adam and Barnabas is because Adam is an artificially made man. Mm-hmm. Professor figured it out. Y- yeah. Yeah. And again, Professor knows the answers to questions before he even asks them. So this brings us back to Cassandra. Uh Uh-huh. And she is still listening to this tape. (laughs) And, you know, I think think what happened was Nicholas Blair, because he asked her, whose voice is that? Whose voice is on the record? She's like, I don't know. And she was like, I don't know. The voice sounds familiar. And he was like, well, then you sit there and you listen to it until you figure it out. So I think that's what she's been doing. She's been trying to figure out whose voice this is. First, we need to figure out whose voices on the recording right and and cassandra was like i figured it out it's dr lang but he's he's dead i think that was another moment where she's like nicholas nicholas right <laughs> uh, it's dr lang but she was like um he's dead i killed him and, and oh you stupid girl you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the but, good news is it's dr lang bad news is i killed exactly, him exactly <laughs> exactly but the fact that he's dead doesn't seem to phase nicholas very much so he, because Nicholas is Nicholas, yeah. and he summons Eric back from the dead yeah. <laughs> to Simple ask as him. That. Exactly. I mean, it's like, oh, no problem. No I'll problem. be right back. <laughs> right. And so he asks, he summons Eric back from the grave and asks him about the experiment. And Lang does come out and tells him and says he did it from dead body parts. So Mm-mm. being Nicholas and you know being out on his afternoon walks is the kind of crap he does on his evening walk on the I grounds. Know, right. <laughs> Could I go walk on the graveyard? Yeah. And Cassandra, like at this point, she still thinks that Nicholas intends to destroy Adam so that her curse can 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 continue. Right. But that's not Nicholas's plan. It's not his plan. She he don't give a crap about her curse anymore. No. Not that he's real. Not not now that he's realized that Adam is an artificially made man. That's not his. He doesn't care about Barnabas anymore. Yeah. Um. He wants to keep him alive because he's the first man in a new race of species, mm-hmm. and he warns her that if she tries to destroy Adam, he will destroy her permanently. Hmm. But Angelique, she cannot help herself. I know. She she's thinks she's going to get away going behind Nicholas's back. T- completely. Like, she is Are you stupid? Stupidly plans to kill Adam anyway. She thinks that she can outsmart Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the day. And so this is the point. You know, afternoon walk for Nicholas. He goes back out and summons the dead body parts. Good God. Like, like the bodies from yeah. which, you know, Eric one got One with no head, parts. one with no arm. Yeah, one standing there with one leg, oh you know. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> crazy. And it's, but, but he's... He he did this so that they could tell him where Adam was. Yeah, it's like they they could, they could feel where their body parts right. were. Like, right. Ugh, and, and so weird. this part... It kind of made me sad because this is when he befriends Adam. He figures out where he is. Yeah. And Adam is on a good path right now, on a very good path. Yeah. Because Professor Stokes has been teaching him and, you know, he's he's found love in Carolyn and, you know, he's on his way to being a man. Yeah. Maybe a mediocre man, but, you know, but a, a man ed- just the same. An educated yeah. human being. Yes. And he immediately begins to plant and corrupt Adam's mind. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. He tells Adam that he should be strong-willed and shouldn't always do what others want him to do. If he wants something, then take it. Take you know? it. Yeah. And Nicholas tells Cassandra where Adam is hiding and warns her again to stay away from him. I don't even know why he told her. But I think because he was confident. You know, I can tell you where he is, but you're not going to kill him. I'm going to find out if you try. Maybe he was hoping she would, so he could destroy her forever. Yeah. You know. Like, like this, this was yeah. This is my point. Like, I, I, I asked the question too. Why did he tell her? You know. But I kind of think he wanted to tell her. I think he wanted he wanted her to know just so she would try, and he wanted her to fail just so he could torture her a little more. Because I think Nicholas enjoys torturing her. I, I really think he does. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it seems a little obvious yeah. <laughs> when he's laughing in her face. And uh, about just, her skeleton hands. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I agree. I think he found a lot of pleasure in giving her grief. I, 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 I think so. I think so. You know, Cassandra obsesses over Lang's tape and eventually finds herself at Adam's room. She stands over him and says that he shouldn't die by magic or Nicholas will know it was her. Right. So she picks up the axe just in time to bring it down on top of Adam and Nicholas shows up. Of course. <laughs> Nicholas saves her from, from Adam because Adam wakes up and, you know, Adam is, you know, twice the size of Cassandra. He could Cassandra. physically take her down. Yes. And sends her back to the drawing room. But again, Angelique cannot help herself. 
she she goes back to the drawing room. She she decides that Nicholas will follow through with destroying her. So she's going to have one last, last ditch, ditch effort at Adam here. Yeah. So whatever happens to her, she wants Nicholas to know that she won. <laughs> right. It was like she had something to prove. She couldn't stand that Nicholas was more powerful and higher up in the hierarchy than her, uh-huh. you know? Uh-huh. So she goes to her favorite toy, picks up the voodoo doll and, <laughs> and, and attempts to stick the pins in. But Nicholas catches her then, too. <laughs> Jeez. Nicholas, Nicholas is a man of his word, takes away her power, and makes her into a simple mortal woman, Cassandra Collins. She is We've no longer We've never Angelique. seen her this vulnerable without yes. her powers, never. Like, the ritual he does, it was it was like, this hand is no longer the hand of my I master. I Oh, my that. gosh. <clears throat> it was crazy. He got so sinister. It was like, oh. And not not only not only does he doesn't immediately kill her, he lets her stew about it. And not only does he take her power away, he orchestrates a fight between Cassandra and Roger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like Roger comes down the stairs to pick a fight with Cassandra and wants to know why she didn't love him and why she never made time for him. And I mean, Cassandra just c- completely throws him to the curb and leaves and leaves to go to the old house. And Roger's like, "What the heck just happened?" He's kind of right though, whether it was. Uh, What's the word? Whether he was, whether whether it was provoked or not from Nicholas, like he, Roger was kind of right. He had he a point. He was totally right. Because like she just totally, like the second she got to Collinwood, didn't want to leave Collinwood. Right. They couldn't want, didn't want to go on a honeymoon. Right. Faked a sprained angle and any excuse. Yeah. This is just another one of them. I agree. So I, I, def- I definitely think Roger was in the right asking all those questions. He had every right to ask. Yeah. But Nicholas said something to the effect of what maybe it wasn't exactly this, but he said something to the effect that he planted that psychic psychically in Roger's mind to make her, to make him come down and pick a fight with her. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I'm something to that effect. I know, I know that Nicholas had a lot to do with that, but I also think this was probably stewing in Roger's mind too. Yeah. It was a legit feeling in Roger. Absolutely. But like you said, yeah, I think Nicholas just kind of played with his mind to get him to go down there. Dude, if he can summon back dead body parts, he can plant an idea in Roger's mind. For real. (laughs) So, Cassandra, a mortal woman, no longer Angelique, she's just Cassandra now, goes down to the old house and knocks on the door. (laughs) And Barnabas answers the door like, what could you possibly want? You know? Yeah. And defeated and mortal and pretty much realizing she's gonna die at this point tells him I was the mistress of this house once. I deserve to come in. Let me in. And he's like, what? What? <laughs> Ew. <laughs> I was like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have the right to come here. And Barnabas cannot figure out why she's all of a sudden admitting it. Why, why now? Yeah, yeah. After badgering her for so long and her yeah. denying it for so long. Yeah. Like, and like, like we said, I was like, is this going to be the moment that she admits it? Is she going to come clean? Is right. she going to come clean? And then just boom. The way she admits it, though, I was the mistress of this house once. I deserve to come here. Yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, uh, by all means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that if she hadn't said that, he would have kicked her out. But oh, yeah. OK, you intrigued me. Come on in. Yeah. You know, <laughs> go on. And she tells him <laughs> she tells him they're both human and she wants to know why he never loved her. He quickly comes back with like, why didn't you ever love me? And quickly, without a thought, goes, because I love Josette. Mm hmm. <laughs> Uh-huh. Even after 200 years, she still cannot bear that statement that he loves Josette. Yeah. And she turns away with a look of disgust on her face when he says it. Just still cannot stand the thought of that. I know. And she tells him that if she has to die this night, then he must die too. And holds up the pistol to Barnabas's face and prepares to shoot. But Cassandra has already begun to weaken and is so weak that she can't even pull the trigger. And uh, we learn later that Nicholas also staged this too, made it to where she was so weak she couldn't pull he couldn't pull the trigger. That's right. So I mean, Nicholas has got his hand in everything, and she pulls the hood up over her head. And when Barnabas, you know, tries to look her in the face again, he like grabs her by the shoulders and turns her around or something. Her her face is completely beyond recognition. Yeah. She's an old old woman, kind of like she was with the portrait. Yeah. And she can't even be recognized. Like nobody recognizes her. And yeah. <laughs> and he demands to know what she did to make Nicholas do this to her and wants to know just what Nicholas is. But Angelique doesn't give him any answers. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Like, like instead of like, I mean, of course he's shocked, but he was like, what did you do to Nicholas? What happened? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I've, I've never seen anybody overtake you. Yeah. I think it was pretty shocking for him too. Yeah. It's crazy. And while she's aging, 
the portrait and Vicky's room is also beginning to change. Yes. And Vicky gets Julia to tell her about the portrait changing. Mm -hmm. And Vicky comments that she wishes she had never bought the painting at all. Mm -hmm. But she was just compelled to. Kind of like... Sam Evans being compelled to paint Laura. You know? I'm sorry, we just came off the Phoenix with Jewel, so I'm kind of, (laughs) that's still kind of fresh in my brain a little bit. (laughs) But, but also Vicky was compelled to take the painting with, with Sam Evans and Laura. Yes. You know, so it, that, that's kind of what this reminded me of. She's like, I was compelled to buy it. Well, it's not the first time Vicky's been compelled to buy a painting, you know? Right. So, side note. And then Julia um, goes down to the old house to check on Barnabas and finds Angelique there. Mm-hmm. And when Angelique runs out, Julia urges and urges Barnabas to go after her and destroy her. Mm. And Barnabas tells her that he um, had it his chance. Yeah. He could have shot her, but he couldn't do it. Yeah. Like when, when Cassandra was too weak to fire the gun, Barnabas took it from her. Yeah. Yeah. And he says that he values life now that he is human. But Julia, <laughs> I know, right? Jeez. But Julia still wants to destroy her. Yeah. And she asks Barnabas why this time is any different. And he says for once she wasn't pretending. And all he wants to do is watch. <sighs> watch and see. Angelique burned him so bad that when it came down to her death, all he wanted to do was watch her die. I know. Wow. Yeah. I, okay, okay. I'm sorry, bunny trail here. Because when Barnabas was a human... He was very caring, cared about human life. Oh, yeah. Was not an evil man. Very understanding, very level-headed. I mean, when Vicky showed up on his doorstep, and she, you know, he had he was baffled by her, perplexed by her, had no idea who she was. Maybe she's a witch, but he still cared for her. Yeah. Still had genuine concern for her. Yeah. And, but now that he's human again, Angelique has burned him so bad, has calloused him so bad that all he want, wants to do is stand and watch her die. Just mm. sit there and watch her die. That's mm. that's incredible to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, how how we know how badly Angelique burned him, but my gosh, how bad did he get hurt that all he can do is watch her die? Yeah. Whew. I know it. <laughs> well, when Roger and Vicky are talking and Angelique in her very in her very old state comes banging on the door and neither of them obviously can can recognize her. Yeah, nobody knows who she is. And shortly after that, Barnabas and Julia show up too, and Roger wants Julia to examine her and help her any way that she can. Yeah. But Julia tells them her heart is barely beating and it's only a matter of minutes. Yeah. When they go back into the drawing room where Angelique was lying, she's no longer there. Like, yeah. She's not there at all. Yeah. And she has she has gone to Nicholas yeah. to beg one more time for him to change his mind. Yep. And he tells Angelique that he planned for her to feel the fear that she feels now because he wanted her to feel what Barnabas has felt all these friggin' years. All these years. This is intense, you guys. It kind of <laughs> is. Then he tells her that she should go and beg Barnabas's forgiveness. He's like, you don't need mine, you need his. <laughs> yeah. And if she can get Barnabas to forgive her, Nicholas will let her live. That Nicholas, He's like, torture. <laughs> Literal. This, this is like super tor- like this is cruel even for Nicholas you know yeah. even I mean we've all enjoyed watching Angelique get her just desserts but this is like come on Nicholas just put her out already you know but again like we said I think he just purely enjoys it he enjoys it, it. he and en- oh Nicholas says that this see this is Nicholas says that this is an amusing idea I don't think that he actually believed that Barnabas would forgive her yeah I just think it was a way of torturing Angelique even, even more yep. and giving her false hope yep. you know because he enjoys it. I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it, guys. He enjoys it. <laughs> but, of course, Angelique will try anything, and she does go to Barnabas and begins to plead her case. Yeah. And begs for his forgiveness. It's, oh, God, this is such a profound scene. Such a profound scene. Yeah. You know, she's come to ask for his forgiveness, but he is so jaded towards her and, so, and filled with so much hate towards her that... I'm not even sure he can hear her words at this point. Right. It's just white noise. It's just like a clanging cymbal, like the Bible yeah. says. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's just sitting there in his chair, you know, just like not even looking at her, you yeah. know. And he, he thinks it's a trick. And he's like, you expect me to believe that after you caused the death of everyone I knew and loved? And she be, she begs, she begs until the bitter end for him to forgive her. But Barnabas won't forgive her. Not only for what she's done to him, but what she has done to others with the dream curse and his mother and Josette. Yeah. He just cannot forgive her and then reminds her that she didn't forgive him either. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. 
She didn't forgive him either when he asked for forgiveness. Yep. When he, when he asked her for forgiveness, she turned him into a vampire. Yep. And so Angelique dies without his forgiveness. Damn. And, well, our first episode back after, you know, months. We all know how long it's been. That is the death of Cassandra Collins, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where we're going to stop for now. The next time we will pick it back up because that's not the end of Angelique, guys. We know. Just all the aftermath after her first death. This was her, this was her punishment for not being able to complete the dream curse. This yes. was her punishment from Nicholas. Yes. So. Guys, that's what we got for you this time. We are so happy you decided to come back and join us again. We are so happy to be back. We're so happy to re- release a new content, and we just appreciate you guys so very much. We really, really do. Um, so since it's been a while, we'll just we'll remind you our contact information has not changed. Um, Between the Shadows 2021 at Gmail. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on YouTube. Like and subscribe. It definitely does help us out, and we appreciate it. But until next time, friends, remember to keep it between us and the shadows. Good night, everyone. Good night. It's too late, Angelique. Josette has been dead for almost two centuries. My mother, too. You murdered them both. I will never forget. I will never forget the look on my mother's face when she saw me, when she knew what I was. I cannot forgive. I'm sorry. If peace were mine to forgive, I would not have to be honest. I cannot forget the suffering that you've caused in this house, even now since you've returned. The dream? No, Angelique. Even if I forgave you for what you did to me, I could never forgive you for what you've done to others. I asked your forgiveness. Your answer was to make me a vampire. I wanted forgiveness because I could not give you the love that you wanted. Angelique, you and I could never forgive each other. Never. You've been listening to Between the Shadows, a Dark Shadows podcast. All original Dark Shadows music, video clips, images, and media are the sole property of Dan Curtis Productions and is only used to promote Dark Shadows and should not be distributed, copied, or reproduced.